welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The text for the third Sunday after Epiphany on January 21st, 2024, are Jonah 3, 1 through 5 and verse 10, Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12, 1 Corinthians 7, 29 through 31, and the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. So we mentioned last week that in the second and third Sundays after Epiphany, we have these back-to-back juxtaposed call narratives or the calling of the disciples and talked a, a number of themes of what does that, what does being called mean? What are you called into? Uh, that there are, you know, different aspects of that. How do we narr- how do we talk about that? How do we talk about our moments of the, that moment of commitment to Jesus and, and to following Jesus? And here we have Mark's version. And, but we also have I think it's important to note, which I which we've mentioned before, that these are Jesus' first words in the Gospel of Mark. The time has been fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And so what difference does it make that those words precede the then seeing Simon and his brother uh, the, these fishermen and saying, follow me. And so again, going back to what you were saying last week, Matt, about what are they, what are the disciples being asked to follow and, and move into, they're asked to follow Jesus in a time, in a period of time that has already been fulfilled and the effects of that fulfillment or the results of that fulfillment are ongoing in the present and that the kingdom of God has already come near and is ongoing in the present because both the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near are perfect tense verbs, meaning that the action is completed, but the effect is ongoing in the present. And so, so that even the, the kingdom of God having come near precedes Jesus' ministry. And so I that is something that I would want to explore homiletically is that the distinctiveness of Mark's call or the call narrative is entering into a time that has been fulfilled and is ongoing and what that means and that the kingdom of God has come near where, when, how, why, what does that mean in Mark? And that, that is, uh, that, that, and that coming nearness of the kingdom of God is in part what it means to fulfill one's call or to follow Jesus in the gospel of Mark. So that's uh, some initial thoughts I had on this passage. Uh, it's really good, Caroline. I and I'm gonna I'm gonna drop us a layer uh, from from what you've said just to highlight uh, what what Matt said uh, last week. Uh, in the sense that the call nearers of are different, and um, again, the way I often heard these texts is is. You know, everybody was called to be a a fisherman. And I think one of the exciting things that I found um, actually reading Luke was that um, um, everybody wasn't a fisherman. (laughs) Uh, And and so I think um, it's... I'm I'm not. (laughs) I'm not. No, I, I don't do snakes and I don't do tweets of snakes. So no worms for me. So I don't fish. But but I digress. I digress. Um, but uh, I think I. it's <laughs> I I think it's important for us to notice that what we have here is Jesus speaking the language of the people he's talking to at the moment, and so these are fishermen, and so he calls them to a new livelihood in the language that they will understand. And I think that is a better way of reading this text. Um, Matt, you were asking last week, or you were acknowledging last week, that so many times we think of a call as simply being to the priesthood or to, or to a certain kind of ministry. And yet that's not what being called is. Uh, Caroline, I think you were the one that said being called to be a disciple, 
of Jesus. And all of us are disciples in our spheres of influence. And I think that's a better way of reading this text than to a particular profession, but more to um, a way of being representatives of God in the flesh, in our spheres of influence. Um, so that's taking us a step down from what you were talking about uh, theologically uh, in terms of the moment that we are in, uh, which each of the texts this week will give us an opportunity to speak to. But I really did want to highlight the specificity of this language of call to a certain people uh, and in a language that they will understand. That's great. What, what I hear from you too, or I want to comment on two things. The, the question about the timing and um, that you mentioned, Caroline, that part of the timing as well is John's arrest, that yes. that triggers something here, whether that's a last straw or some kind of a an indicator or what. Uh, John's arrest is not going to end well, and we have to imagine that it makes Jesus sad, angry, determined something, um, right? This is not a, there's not a shrug. There's something about this that's scandalous or mm -hmm. that scandalous is the wrong word. Something about this that's pivotal, that, that initiates a new direction maybe. And then like what you were saying, and that's maybe that has to do as well with what does it mean for the time to be fulfilled and the kingdom drawing near that in part, the kingdom that Jesus proclaims in an acts in Mark is a kingdom against oppressive powers which we'll see next week in terms of spiritual powers. But, and then, yeah, Joy, that, you know, that line, I'll make you fish for people or uh, more accurately, maybe I'll make you fishers of people. It just doesn't, it doesn't sing in English for me. Uh, you know, I, I don't, um, it for a couple of reasons, song, but what's that? It used, it used to, to be a song. song. There was a song. Yeah. Fishers of men. Fishers of men. Fishers of men. We've lost. I will make you fishers. But men, no, not men. Anyway. That was a word. Follow. I even knew all the hand motions and everything. I see. There's you reminded me of them. Oh, did we did we slip away, Matt? You were saying something. I'm sorry. No, this is more exciting than what I was gonna say for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I can I recognize that. Um no, two things. That line, I will make you fish for people. Like make is kind of weird. Like what do we mean by that? Uh, it's just, you know, <laughs> it's not the best verb. And it's poieo in Greek, which doesn't really help much, but could have a sense of like form you. I, I might form you into this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recreate you or something like that. I mean, these are not translations as much as me trying to transliterate maybe. But then also the idea of fishers of people, which has typically been mean it's, you know, it's been interpreted in a lot of traditions as, you know, plucking souls out, you know, uh, out of the, out of the, just before they're falling off the cliff, e language of like winning souls for Christ, you know, that kind of language is off putting to a lot of people for good reasons, because of how it's been misused as if this is a contest and about fishing and bait and luring people and just uh, language. I think we want to distance ourselves from and acknowledges there. So I kind of wonder, what does that mean to fish for people or to be a fisher of people? And maybe it's just about what Jesus commands, which is just following that there's no, he never says, I want you to know everything. He never says you have to believe this stuff. He just says, follow me. And the following of course goes to the cross in, in Mark's gospel. That's the hados, the road he's on. But along that way, in Mark at least, what Jesus is known for is not teaching a lot of doctrine. It's about ministries of compassion and deliverance. And so maybe that's, I don't, I don't know quite how to push back against that song and, and a lot of imagination around that verse, but I do want to open up people's minds to think that that might mean something different than we've got to get as many numbers as possible inside of this building. Oh. Go ahead, I was going to say. I was going to say. I the, thought you were going to sing it around or something. <laughs> the hypocrisy of the the church right now that we're being held accountable for is we've we've gone for the big numbers. We've gone for the big catch. We've um, come up with all of the strategies of uh, bait and um, 
we haven't been compassionate. We haven't done the very things that Jesus does in this gospel. And, and so, Matt, I think you're spot on to lift this up. And that's exactly what I think. If we are going to rightly and responsibly read the gospel of Mark, that we need to attend to, not just this scene, but how this particular scene is the trajectory um, that many of us don't want to take. Look, I've got a whole bunch of fish that I've got in my net. But what have you done with all of them? And what have they become for others? And that's the trajectory of whether or not we're willing to follow Jesus all the way to the cross. Not just are we willing to be, um, you know, the biggest church out there. Caroline, you were going to say something probably more profound than that. Oh my no! I think that's really I think that's really important uh, and and a kind of and uh, an important critique of the ways in which the church has bought into right these uh, hook line and sinker ha Ooh. ah <laughs> of these uh, these you know quick fixes for our declining numbers and 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 yet where. Where is it that the the hallmark of a thriving church is compassion and not and not the numbers? I was going to point out that I think maybe going back a little bit to your point, uh, Joy, in terms of speaking their language and mm -hmm. meeting them where they are, there is going to be something about that in the Gospel of Mark that that. Jesus goes to goes to places and spaces that seem uh, that are surprising to say the least. In fact, his very first, you know, he, his very first uh, act in Mark will be this exorcism of casting out an unclean spirit. But you know, going up to Tyre and Sidon and going into these places, boundaries, you know, crossing these boundaries, but going to where people are. And there's something about that, I think, in this passage too, is that, yeah, they're, they're, they are fishermen and the emphasis, the, the details that emphasize that, uh, that they passed, Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, saw Andrew casting it into the sea for they were fishermen. Okay. Thanks for letting us know that, you know, and then uh, and then they went a little farther. He saw James son of Zebedee and his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And I, it reminded me of so many conversations that I've had with students over the years, who have sat in this office and said, "I felt the call by God. This is, you know, yeah, yeah, you could, because you have to tell your call story, your call story, like a hundred times, and all the paperwork and all the candidacy stuff and whatever, and 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 also that sense of like, if you don't have this like incredible call story, somehow you're not fit for ministry. Like a lightning bolt has to come from the sky, and a, a bush has to burn, and all those kinds of things. And when when sometimes that call is tracing the thread." from what you have what you what you have been doing and now it's moving into a different manifestation of that and i've had so many students say well that was my life before and now i'm you know given my life to jesus in in being a pastor and i'm like no you know uh, like i remember one student was like well who is this like this super famous basketball player in uh in in high school in minnesota and I wasn't here at the time and I don't know anything about basketball, but she's like super famous. And she's like, I was, you know, a basketball star. I was really into basketball, but now I'm a pastor. I'm like, no, you bring all of that with you, right? The, the, everything about that experience into this following Jesus. And I, I hear that here, mm -hmm. like that, there, that specificity of being fishermen, <laughs> anglers, uh, see, I know something about fishing. Uh, that that specificity that somehow that matters and that life matters and what they what they did and how that is going to 
continue into their following of Jesus and translate into new possibilities for bringing about the kingdom of God. So I think that could be another sort of homiletical pastoral entrance into this passage when we've had these two sort of, we've had these two call stories back to back. Okay. Should we go to Jonah? Yeah. Speaking of calling and fish. (laughs) Fish. Is that the connection? Ah. I hope not. I think it's about what happens when you when you get a when call. you preach, I guess. But um, yeah, where where do you go with Jonah this week? I have ideas. All right, tell <laughs> us. Well, tell us. I have don't. a couple too, but you go first. <laughs> well, it is a story about God's compassion to a city. I think you have to play up just how awful Nineveh sounds in the ears mm-hmm. of ancient people. You do. The Assyrian Empire were a bunch of bad, bad dudes in terms of their reputation. I mean, these it was just a brutal empire towards its, its enemies. And Nineveh is its capital. And so the assumption that that God has compassion for the people of Nineveh is about as disgusting of a claim as you might imagine for certain people at certain times in the history. You know, it's just, these are the worst or the worst in the perspective of the people of Israel. And so it's not just about Jonah's obedience and disobedience. And this is what Jonah resents at the end of the story, where Jonah's like, I knew you were going to forgive them. <laughs> I knew it. Mm-hmm. And But here's the story of the forgiveness, which is a, you know, kind of a funny story in that all Jonah has to do is preach doom. And so this is where I would suggest adding verses 6 through 9, because in 6 through 9, you get the story of the king. And it's the king who converts, it's the king who leads the city in this conversion, which in some ways is a demonstration, not saying you go and convert the powerful people and everybody falls into line, but it's about, so much of the Old Testament is about the the abuses of leadership and about Mm -hmm. the innocent people who suffer because of the lack of faithfulness, the lack of self-control of people in power. And here you have a person in power who leads repentance on behalf of the whole. And one more thing, I just, a friend of mine in the business, as we say, uh, just told me this a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, really. And um, I just love the idea. Maybe you know this. There's a Jewish midrash, there's an an old Jewish teaching about the Pharaoh of Egypt. Have you heard this? The Pharaoh of Egypt stands on the shores of the Red Sea and laments all that has happened in the story of Exodus and then wanders, just wanders the land and finally ends up knocking on the door of a great city. And the people of this great city recognize him as royalty because of how he's dressed and how he conducts himself. Eventually he's made king and God blesses him with a long life and the city's Nineveh. So there's a Jewish teaching that the king of Nineveh here is actually Pharaoh like 500 years later, who now when confronted by God and God's prophet, makes the right choice. It's this beautiful fable of, um, and a beautiful way of kind of, you know, playing with the cracks in scripture that we find, but I'm not saying you have to preach on that, but it's this lovely story (laughs) of, of Jewish interpreters trying to stitch together some really difficult aspects of scripture to undergird this unshakable belief that God is compassionate even to the worst of the worst, so-called worst of the worst. Um, And that second chances are real. I love that. I've never heard it, but I love it. I hadn't either. And I've Googled it and it's all over the place. (laughs) (laughs) At least in Jewish sources, you know, not all over the place, but there is a particular uh, midrash. Anyway, go ahead, Joy. Yeah, no, what I love about it is this, um, what did you call it? The unshakable conviction of God's compassion. Uh, that is so what this is all about. And what does it mean for us to be willing to let God be God? Uh, to let God say that forgiveness is, is possible, um, that people can respond, will respond to me. And, um, <laughs> To, to stay with the story of Jonah is all you have to do is do what I ask you to do and let me do what I do best. And, and, and in some ways, that is what being a, a real disciple is, 
is knowing that our task is to bear witness to a God who is compassionate, a God who has not given up on setting the world right, even though humanity keeps messing up. And when we when we take that perspective, um, even reluctantly, uh, the, the, the Jewish midrash that I'm aware of is that um, the point of the story of Jonah is don't be like Jonah um, because of his disobedience, because of his not, his unwillingness uh, to have God be compassionate. For, for Nineveh. Um, but that fits with, you know, what, what we're reading as we go forward in the context of, of uh, the epistle. Um, this is a cast and class system where the other is bad. Do we dare live a life that will bear witness to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit where folks will take a double look and say, Maybe I want to follow this compassionate God too. That's what it means to be a disciple. I was going to say something uh, really similar, Joy, in kind of pulling off of the commentary, uh, who's quoting another commentary. Uh, Jonah lurks in every Christian heart, and yes. that 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 part of what it it's going to mean to follow Jesus for Mark is to follow that compassion and see where it leads. Uh, where, where does, where does, where do you see, see Jesus compassion for whom, when, how, why, and that, and that, that compassion at, at the end leads to the cross. And so it's, we're, we're following, we're following how compassion is going to get played out in Jesus ministry. So. Psalm? Does, does this give us the psalm um, that, um, you know, th this psalm says we don't put our confidence in uh, riches, um, therefore we don't hope in taking from others what will increase what we have. Um, so don't put hopes in robbery. Um, don't set our hearts on riches, but may our soul uh, await for God alone, that our hope is in God alone, and the God in whom we trust, the God in whom we trust is going to have compassion not only for us, but for those who have proven to be our enemy, not just are our enemies, but is proven to be our enemies. So the God that is our refuge is their refuge too. That makes this a difficult psalm this week, and yet it also makes it an incredible psalm because when we say that God alone is our rock in salvation, our fortress, then we are allowing God to be the rock, salvation, and fortress of others as well, or at least the challenges for us to do that. I think for me, given what we've talked about so far, the psalm becomes uh, incredible good news in that because to follow Jesus is hard work and is risky and fearful and and will take you to places you don't want to go. And yet God is our refuge and God is our strength and God is our mighty rock and God is our foundation. And so uh, that that absolute trust in in God, no matter where that following, no matter where that compassion takes us, is I think where the psalm has some good news for us. First Corinthians seven. Well, now this we're is, back um... to time. <laughs> we're, we're back to fulfilling the time, and what 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 season are we in? What moment are we in? Um, and this is a portion of of uh, the words to. Uh, the followers in Corinth that the moment is upon uh, upon us and uh, that we are to live a peculiar reality in the midst of uh, the appointed time having having come upon us. It becomes peculiar that when you should mourn, you're not mourning, or when you should rejoice, you're not rejoicing. When you have to buy, um, you act as if you don't. Okay, I got to stop and read that again. That doesn't make sense. But that disruption 
uh, is in many ways the intrusion of God that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, the heavens breaking open into um, the reality that we are living in right now. And when we find ourselves in there and we pause, and I'll turn us back to that psalm, that our, that our rock, our fortress, and our salvation is God alone. It's none of these things. It's none of the riches. It's none of the um, the, um, the um, what's the word I want to use? Um, um, rituals. I didn't mean to do an alliteration there, but uh, uh, it's none of the festivals and and uh, the festivals and celebrations, the mourning uh, and and partying. Um, but it is a confidence in God who has intruded into our reality. And if you if you read this portion, which where the words that Paul are, are is uh, the, the letters is 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 speaking to now is going to speak to the question that they are asking, um, as you mentioned last week, Caroline. Uh, the the chapters before was like, okay, there's there's been a lot of talk about you guys, and and I've heard, and I've got to make this uh, public, and and so now now God uh, now uh, Paul has addressed that, and now Paul is going to turn them to the moment that they are in to remind them of the people that they are to be. And if if we look at that, then that pairs up with all the other texts that we've read to, today, because the people that they are to be in their spheres of influence is to be a peculiar people uh, who let folks know that the inbreaking of God is here, which means they can't look like first century Romans and Greeks. Yeah, it's such a... What you're talking about here is so important, and how this ties into, I think, math or Mark's gospel as well, in the sense of urgency and mm -hmm. and how the church lives faithfully to the same kind of urgency Jesus expresses in Mark, and the same kind of urgency Paul expresses here. This is a a text I think is really important for understanding Paul in general when he says the appointed time has grown short, the present form of this world is passing away. Later on in chapter ten. He speaks about us on whom the ends of the ages have come. I mean, Paul is trying to shape a community and an ethic that really believes it could be next Wednesday, folks. Yeah. And, and so to help people understand that, that's where Paul acquires some of his weirdness to our modern eyes. It's why just before this, his teaching on marriage is a little bizarre. It's why he tells enslaved people, ah, just be content with how life is. I mean, he's just... It's kind of like we don't have time to deal with some of these things because it's a singular issue. And so how do we live faithfully to that 2,000 years later without becoming a kind of literally apocalyptic community that's that lives dangerously right. um, or submits its members to uh, you know unhealthy ways of living? And, and just to note that that's what the church has been trying to figure out, but also that Edward Pillar in his commentary talks about time becoming concertinaed, you know, <laughs> compressed on itself, which, you know, that's how it, what's what life feels like when you're suffering grief or loss or something intense has just happened and you experience time so differently, sometimes much more slowly or much more quickly. And just to help people get a sense for what tragedy can do or what grief can do or what being upended in life can do to our perceptions of what's really important and what's not because you don't always make great decisions when you're in those tragic moments but you can come out of them with this renewed perspective that is really life-changing and so i wonder how that applies to some of the other things we've talked about today <laughs>